most exciting part of the mushroom growing process, the fruiting. This is where you apply all the critical thinking skills that you've developed up until this point in a brand new way. This is where you notice how the fungi begins to work to produce the final reproductive mechanism, the mushroom. And the inputs that you give it, the environment that you provide, the care that you give your mushrooms is going to influence your yield, how well they grow, and how happy they seem to be. So once you put all the pieces together and your grain spawn to the final substrate and you've incubated for the given amount of time, you're ready to fruit. How will you know you're ready to fruit? Some species will show you by producing pins or other primordial formations. Other species, you're just gonna need to trust those who've come before us and have already proven the concept so that you'll know exactly when to expose them to fruiting conditions. For top fruiting species, you're often gonna notice a lot of pin formation, primordia, and even hyphal knots. Once you see a lot of these covering your substrate, it's time to fruit. So choose your chosen fruiting environment and expose the mushrooms to that environment. There are four main things that you need to consider when fruiting your mushrooms. Those are gonna be the correct humidity, the correct temperature, and the correct amount of fresh air exchange. The fourth one is going to be the proper amount of light. This one is not as big of a deal as the other three. Mushrooms can be fruited in the dark. However, they don't typically fruit well. If you're fruiting mushrooms from a shoebox, the easiest is going to be to take the other shoebox that you purchased and place it on top as the humidity dome with the proper holes on the sides and the ends. If you're fruiting in a monotub, you can set that shoebox into that monotub and let that be the humidity container for it as well. If you're fruiting on the counter, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to spraying that mushroom and around that mushroom often. You can go so far as to set up a little grow kit block in the back of a cardboard box and misting the cardboard box all around all of the sides so that it retains humidity and provides it to your mushrooms as well. Be sure to check the growth parameters on the species that you've chosen to grow to see the exact right amount of humidity, temperature, fresh air exchange, and of course, light. If you're having difficulty finding a place to fruit under a grow light in your house, you can fruit next to a window with indirect sunlight. I do advise against direct sunlight as this will dry out your mushrooms and potentially your substrate and you won't get a proper flush. The monotub is one of the most low-tech, hands-off ways to grow in your home. There are varying ways that you can set your monotub up to optimize the conditions of the species that you're choosing to grow. If you're fruiting your oyster mushrooms in a bucket, I would advise building a monotub and placing that bucket in the monotub so that you're not having to spray all sides of the bucket as you would if you're putting on a counter. If you're fruiting them out of a bag that you've put together and you're only putting one spot for the mushrooms to fruit out of, this is not as necessary and you could fruit it straight on the counter. When you're fruiting oyster mushrooms, if you're using a bucket, you can set that directly into fruiting conditions at the time of preparation. For that, I would suggest using a monotub. If you're gonna wait until it's fully colonized, I would suggest covering your grow kit with micropore tape on all the holes that you're expecting the oyster mushrooms to fruit out of. If you're preparing a bag or you've gotten a grow kit, has a filter patch already installed, you're gonna wait the proper amount of time and then you're gonna make an X where you want the mushrooms to fruit from and the mushrooms will grow out of that spot because of the fresh air environment that you've just given it. You don't need to make a huge X, you can keep your X's small around three to four inches and just make sure that that area stays moist until you start to see pins and continue to give it more and more moisture. If you're fruiting in a monotub, you'll just wait for those pins to form and begin to grow out of the bag from the holes that you created when you put it to fruit. This reishi mushroom is ready to be put into a fruiting environment. Reishi mushrooms like a high CO2 environment to produce these nice antler formations. And depending on how you want to fruit reishi, if you do, this could be the way that you initially begin. Once I open this bag and put it into a humid environment, it'll begin to branch out and get to where it's ready to drop its spores. As long as it's contained within a high CO2 environment, it will continue to produce these antler formations. So I do a different process when I fruit my reishi. You could also put it into a fruiting tent at this point and allow it to fruit that way. You can also take a reishi block and put it straight into the fruiting tent and get the conch-like formations as opposed to the antlers. It's really up to you when you're fruiting reishi exactly what you want it to look like and that determines how you put it to fruit. 
So to put this reishi to fruit, I'm simply going to cut off the top of the bag. And then I'm going to come through and I'm going to cut it down the sides. And pull that down to expose the reishi fruit body. At this point, I can either pull the plastic under the block and set it in, or I can go ahead and cut the plastic off if I know that this is the only fruits that I'm trying to get off this block. The reason you might want to leave the plastic is it would allow you to put it back into a CO2 heavy environment by pulling the bag together and putting some clips on the side to retain that high CO2 and the moisture on the block for a second round. So I'm going to do it that way in case the block still seems like it has enough moisture and nutrition to fruit again and having the excess plastic is not going to be a real big deal. So now that I've pulled the plastic down, you can additionally take a rubber band and secure the plastic against the block. This isn't necessary, but it does help get everything nice and tidy in the box so that you're not fighting with the plastic. And now I'm ready to set it in my box. When I put the reishi down in the box, one thing that we notice is the reishi is too tall and the lid won't cover the reishi without encountering the actual mushroom. So I'm going to turn my box on its side and place my reishi in the box like that. Then I'll miss the entirety of the box on all of the walls. Miss the underside of my lid. and cover my box. Now anytime that I see that the moisture has dried up on the box or on the lid, then I can just take the lid off and I can spray more moisture to make sure that the reishi stays in a nice humid environment.